So I know I, I tell you this is the grammar page we're going to, but actually it's the table of contents because we always color in the table of contents. I should just start telling you to do that. When you turn in your grammar vocab quiz, just go ahead and go right to the table of contents because then we'll highlight. Thank you for these. Is that everybody? Yeah. Jacob. Um, the funny thing, I actually threw out my binder too, so I don't have my highlighters with me. Oh, okay. I've got some you can borrow. Not a problem. Okay. All right. So here we are. 34, 35, and 36 today, and we'll need all of the highlighters except green. Someday we will get to green. It won't be till the spring semester, though. All right, so 34 is kind of a mix. We'll do compound subjects and predicates. So that one is a few colors in there. Subjects, because those are always orange, and is a conjunction. Those are pink, and predicates, which are always blue. Uh, we're going to talk about correlative conjunctions, which are conjunctions that are in pairs. There's two working together in one sentence. And then lesson 36, we're going to talk about predicate nominatives and diagramming those. The predicate nominatives key in, you might have heard them as predicate nouns. Predicate nouns, which I like better than predicate nominatives. Predicate nouns. Can we just agree that we want to call them predicate nouns? All right, let's just agree that we like that better. All right, we're good to go. Now we're on grammar page, back to page 201. All your highlighters but green today. Anybody else need something? A, a pink, a yellow, a blue? Okay. All right. Rock and roll, rock and roll. Here we go. All right. How does it work when we do the diagrams in class together that you have for homework? Don't you like it? Yeah. I think what that does is it, as if we talk about them together, then you're not out there on your own trying to figure these things out. And I feel like you're going to learn to do them better because we're doing them in class. Um, so we will definitely want to continue with that today. All right. So here we are with, we don't need that. Let's hide that. All right, we are on page 201. All right, here we go. Here we go. So the first thing are the vocabulary words, which we have right up here. All right, there are just two, and they are abbreviations right here. All right, so we have et al, and we have et cetera. All right, so just those two. Um, you'll need to know what is in pink and yellow. So et al means and others, and this is in reference to additional people, et al. Et cetera also means and others. You see, that is the same. But et cetera is in reference to things, not people. All right, so that's the distinction between those two vocabularies there. Et al and etc. All right, we ready to do the compound subjects. Those are up first, so grab your orange. All right, a compound subject is no surprise here. It is more than one subject. All right, it's more than one subject. How do you know you've got a compound subject? It'll have a conjunction, right? Yes, yeah, so look at this example. Um, just take your orange and highlight this example just so you get used to identifying these. John Langdon and Nicholas Gilman. So that is a compound subject. You've got two people, and the giveaway is the conjunction that connects them. All right? Now, no surprise, a compound predicate is, this, is the same as a subject, but it's now the predicate, more than one predicate. So that would be your verb, more than one verb. I'm going to put a V here just to remind us that the predicate means the verb. 
more than one verb. All right, and so with your blue, you can highlight these in this example. They've underlined them, defines, and safeguards. So we have the subject doing more than one thing. We have two verbs in that sentence. So that is a compound predicate. Um, is it only two? Can you have three verbs? Four? Five? Yeah. Can you have five subjects? Yeah. yeah, you can. Yeah, you absolutely can. All right. It's still known as a compound subject or compound predicate. Uh, you just have to have at least two, and then you have your conjunction to connect. All right, so we look down here, diagramming them. All right, so... When we diagram a compound subject or a compound predicate or a compound adjective or there's a lot of these we're going to go through here in just a minute. It, it looks kind of like this little crayon thing. Doesn't this kind of look like a crayon right here? Yeah, it kind of looks like this crayon. I'm going to highlight it in red there. And then it's got this dash. Sort of. Maybe I can make a dash. A pitchfork. <laughs> oh, I, I think it looks like a crayon. Let's just, and that crayon is, is nice. It's not going to hurt you. All right. I was always told it looked like a rocket ship. It does look like a rocket ship heading in the wrong direction. It's bad if your rocket ship is going sideways. Get out of the way. Yeah. All right, but the crayon, again, is not going to hurt you like a sideways flying rocket ship. All right, and then you would put your compound subject or compound predicate. Those are on the crayon itself. The conjunction would go right here on a dotted line. All right, um, and so here we have our subject. We've got our verb in blue. We've got, what is this right here? Boats. What part of speech? It's our direct object, and then... Notice the conjunction right here on those dot dashed lines, and then there is a what here? It's an adjective. There you go. All right, so you got a compound subject. This is where your crayon is. Turn the page. We're about to get crazy on this. All right, now we got a compound predicate. All right, so we do want to highlight these areas in the diagram. I did not do it in the sentence, but in the diagram, I think it does help to associate the color with the part of speech. So here you notice we've got a crayon, and you can write on both ends of the crayon this time. Here it is, kind of right here. All right, same. We've got our conjunction on the dashed line. Why do we have this line right here? Right here. What, what is this right here? All right, so we've got a direct object. That's why we've got our crayon that looks like it's, you can write on both sides. Yeah, so this is our compound predicate. We've got two verbs. Two verbs. All right, let's keep on trucking. Can you have both? Yes, you can. All right, so here we've got a compound subject and a compound predicate. So we've got all these crazy crayons in one sentence. So here's our compound subject. We just looked at that, the page one back. And this is the same. See, I can just take it and wah, this looks the same right here. All right. We got, you can have both. You can have a compound subject and a compound predicate in the same sentence. Again, constitution is a direct object. That's why it's still in the direct object space. We still, we have that straight line that stops at our main line. All right. And we're trucking along. Can you have a compound direct object? Yes, you can. Yes, you can. So here you notice the crayon is over here where the direct object is. Great compromise and elections. There they are. They're highlighted in orange because they are nouns. Direct objects are nouns. We 
very good. Caleb Strong supported what? He supported the Great Compromise and the election. So there's two things that answer that question, what he supports. So we have these two direct objects. All right, what is this guy down here in pink? All right, this is a prepositional phrase. Remember, it's like our little lounge chair. It's hanging out, lounging in the sentence there. All right, and we have these two adjectives. Boom, boom. We're not done. Can you have compound indirect object? Yes, you can. Here it is. Here's the crayon right here in the indirect object space. Okay. Strong gave John Adams and the Federalist. Right. So those are the indirect objects, and we put them on the crayon right here. All right, we still have the line with the X on it. That is still there. And then we just put the crayon right here because that's where our compound indirect object is. All right. Aren't these fun? Can you have more? Yes. Yeah. Yes, you can. All right, here we go. Compound adjectives. There they are. Uh, Caleb Strong, sedate and stable. There it is. Uh, notice that this is the least look like a crayon. It looks like somebody chopped off the end of your crayon and made it flat. Yes. Yes. If somebody chopped it off and made it flat. So it kind of still could be a crayon, but your little sister or little brother came along and broke off the pointy part, and you're like, now I'm going to have to color with it flat before I go sharpen it. All right, so you can have compound adjectives. There we go. I think that is everything we have diagrammed in the sentence. Um, prepositional phrases, I guess you could. We're not going to talk about these here, um, but I think that's everything. You can have compound adverbs, but we haven't talked about those yet. All right, so let's practice some of these. Turn to your diagrams. On page 206, 206. All right, so let's start with number 27, and you, you can go ahead and uh, okay, let's let's highlight the sentence first. Let's highlight first. Grab your highlighters. Grab your highlighters. Let's highlight first, and we'll diagram as we go. In number 27, um, Jacob, read that sentence for us. Por favor. The claim will require patient guarantee. All right, anybody, what is the subject of that sentence? Infinitive. Too clean. Do you notice anything about it? Infinitive. It's an infinitive. All right, what is the verb in this sentence? Will. Will require. All right, so we have our subject. Oh, wait, no, I'm sorry. We did that. Okay. And we have our verb, which will be blue. Will require. Correct. Now, what is the rest of this? We have patience and endurance. I do notice there's an and, which means we have a crayon. All right, what part of speech is our crayon? How are we going to diagram it? What is this? It's a direct object. Will require what? Patience and endurance. All right, so give it a go. Give it a go. Yep, this is going to be a compound direct object. So here you've got your main line, subject and verb. You've got a direct object. Maybe it's too long. Let me shorten that. All right, and then we're going to have a crayon. Yours look like this. Do you have something special for to clean the subject of this sentence? How should that be written? Diagram. To clean. What is that? It's an infinitive. To infinitive and beyond. So you have your, your infinitive thing, right? Just like that. 
Good to go. All right. Let's do 28. 28. AC, would you read that sentence for us, please? Does Miss Messy dread house chores? No, that is 29. <laughs> Miss Messy should scrub the floor beneath her kitchen table. Miss Messy should scrub the floor beneath her kitchen table. All right, let's find the subject, verb, is there a direct object? Those three things first. Everybody, what is the subject? Miss Messy. Miss Messy, what is the verb? Should scrub. should scrub. Is there a direct object? Yes, what is it? Floor. floor. All right, so let's diagram those three things first. Your subject, your verb. Your direct object, those things first. I'm going to take away this infinitive. This doesn't have an infinitive. And no crayon this time. There's no conjunction. All right, so we're going to start. There we go. We are our subject, our verb, our direct object. Now, we've got some other words in this sentence, but once you get these three things, that everything else kind of fits around it. So you find your subject, you find your verb, you find a direct object. Once you've got those things first, then start looking at the rest of the sentence. So I noticed that we have the here but before for. What is this? It's an adjective, right? So it's, I'm going to highlight it yellow. And then beneath her kitchen table, what is that? Yes, that is a prepositional phrase, beneath her kitchen table. All right, so that the, is, this the is going to go under floor. Da -da -da -da. And it's going to go right there. And then this prepositional phrase, all right, what is the preposition? Beneath. Beneath what? Table, yeah. So table, beneath table, that's the chair. Beneath table. And then her and kitchen. Those are adjectives underneath table. Beneath table, that's your chair. Her and kitchen are the legs of that chair. All right, there we go. I like that her name is Miss Messy. That's funny. It does sound familiar, but I am not messy. Yeah. I have been called that before, Miss Messy. All right, 29. Caitlin, read it for us. Does Miss Messy dread house cleaning? All right, does Miss Messy dread house cleaning? Let's find the three things. What's the first thing we look for? What is it? Miss Messy. What's the next thing we look for? What is it? Does dread. Very good. All right. Do we have a direct object? Yes, we do. What is it? House cleaning. All right. And that's going to take care of this sentence. All right. Go ahead and highlight and diagram it. We have no adjectives, we have no prepositional phrase, we have no um, compound, no conjunction. So this one is pretty much straight, straightforward. Subject, verb, direct object. What's that? It is. Except that her name is Miss Messy, which is kind of fun. I don't know. I see something special about house cleaning. It is a Jaren. How did you know? ING. Yeah. Be on the lookout for those. ING. You should diagram that. Walking like an Egyptian, doing that Egyptian dance there. All right. Rocking on. Okay. I want you to highlight number 30. Try it on your own. It's okay if you make a mistake. Never, never be afraid of making a mistake. Just learn from it. Be afraid if you don't learn from a mistake. That's, that's, the, that's the thing. But it's okay to make a mistake. So try number 30 on your own. I want you to highlight it. Subject, verb, look for a direct object. 
Those are the first things you look for. Subject, verb, direct object. You highlight those first. Diagram those first. I'll give you a hint. This direct object there's something special about it. I'll give you a few seconds to figure this one out and then we'll talk about this one together. Smiley face tattoo on my finger here. I don't know. You just needed it. All right. You ready to discuss this one? You need a few more seconds. Ooh. Do you have one of these? Oh, let me get out of red. Do you have one of these in this sentence? Do you have one of those in your diagram? Mm -hmm. All right. Let's go. Let's go. All right. Subject. Hi. Hi. I want to hear everybody. Everybody. All right. Verb. Hello. Yes. You guys are so smart. First. The direct object. Try to hold on to that one. AC will come back to that one. What is the I loan what? Bucket and mop. Bucket and mop. There it is. All right. Uh, bucket and a mop. Now, AC, what is her here? Do you know? Oh, the indirect object. It is, yes. Yeah, so this her is your indirect object. It goes right here. That's a her. Now, bucket goes on this one. Mop goes on this one. We've got some adjectives that go underneath. What goes underneath bucket? All right, so we've got two adjectives here. And what goes under mop? It says day. And do you have your conjunction right there? Ta-da! Just like that, right? All right, very good. All right, super. All right, stand up. Stand up, stand up. Stand up. You got that, yeah? Okay, give yourself a high five. Pat on the back. Pat on the back. Cheer. Cheer. Now sit back. Okay. All right. Page 207. Page 207. Uh, what is the title of this? Correlative conjunction. What is this talking about? All right. First, let's do the vocabulary up at the top. But uh, I forgot to do the yellow, so I'll add them in now. All right, so let's do the vocabulary up here first. There's four, four, democracy ruled by the people. We all got to experience that yesterday, didn't we? Did mom and dad vote? Yep, yep. Maybe they, I voted early. I voted last week. Um, all right, so that's democracy, ruled by the people. Aristocracy, a powerful nobility. All right, an aristocracy. This would be a king, a queen. You are born into the leadership. All right. A bureaucrat. That's number three, is an appointed government official, a, bu a bureaucrat, a bureaucrat. Remember, you never need to know the spelling, so just know what the meaning is, which is a good thing because, woo, this word has two U's, two A's in it. It's got three different vowels, an A, an E, and a U. Crazy. All right, and a plutocrat. That's not Pluto the dog at Disney. Pluto's in charge. What about the planet? Not the planet in charge, right? It's um, one who has power because of his or her wealth. 
Yeah, although Pluto is president, that's pretty good, isn't it? Would you vote for Pluto as president? <laughs> yes. <laughs> he seems like a nice dog. All right, there's four in there. Four in there. All right, so correlative conjunctions. This is pink. Here we go. Most of this is going to be in pink now. All right, so here we are in the middle. In the middle, we've got a definition. So correlative conjunctions. These connect parts of a sentence that are equal or parallel. They are always used in pairs. Okay, so they're conjunctions, but they are two together in the same sentence. You'll notice that there are four pairs, both and, neither nor, either or, not only, but also. All right, so there's four pairs. You need to memorize those for the vocab quiz next week. You'll have to tell me what these four pairs are. That's why they're stars. It's also on your homework sheet. All right, but they're pairs. They're like shoes, okay? Like two, you get two pair, you get two shoes with one pair. That's what these conjunctions are. You get two conjunctions in one sentence, all right? So let's have your pink candy and let's highlight these examples. So in this sentence, the writings of Elbridge Jerry created both American recruitment and patriotic fervor. Both and. Both and. Working together as the conjunction. Did either Samuel Adams or John Hancock serve with Jerry in the Second Continental Congress? Either or. Working together as the conjunction. Neither John Langdon nor Nicholas Gilman had faith in the Articles of Confederation. Neither nor, working together as the conjunction. One last example, not only the development of the Northwest Territory, but also the retirement of the national debt concerned Elbridge Jerry. Not only, but also working together as the conjunction. All right, and then just some more examples in here. Both and, not only, but also, neither, nor. All right, and you got to have those pairs memorized. There's four pairs, two in each set. All right, you think about them like a shoe. All right, so here's one shoe here. Here's one shoe, and then here's the other shoe. Right? They're like shoes. Each of their legs. Here's the person. Yay. He's wearing big shoes. Yay. Yay. All right, so here they are. They're like two, two shoes, all right, but they work together as one conjunction. All right, so let's do some practice. Um, on page 208, just grab your pink. You're just going to highlight the correlated conjunctions in these four sentences. Just highlight them. All right, in B, everybody, what are the conjunctions, the correlative conjunctions? Either or. Either or. All right, in C, everybody. Neither, Neither nor. D. Both and. Both and. E. Not only. Not only, but also. All right, let's hop up. From there, same page, page 208, look up here. I forgot to highlight this. This is important. Diagramming. Let's highlight this. So you diagram these correlative conjunctions together. One of them is on one side of the dotted line, and one is on the other side. But you notice we still have a crayon. Da -da, da -da, da -da. We still have the crayon here. We still have that dotted dashed line, 
when we have one of those conjunctions on one side and the other one on the other side. They're right there together because they're a pair of shoes. All right, you want to keep the shoes together. So they're right there in the diagram in the crayon together. All right, let's practice some of these. Turn to page 211. 211. And let's see what you do. So number 28, let's highlight first. Highlight first. Laura C., read this sentence for us, please. Both Chase and Lace expect to race. That. Both Chase and Lace expect to race. I think the grammar is trying to be funny by rhyming. Is it funny? Not really. You guys are like, that's not much of a joke. Grammar book, that's not funny. Okay. All right. Highlight it first. Subject, verb, is there a direct object? Highlight it first. It is okay if you highlight them incorrectly. If you make a mistake, it's no, it's no big deal. Just learn from it. What's my subject in 28, everybody? Chase, lace. Okay. Uh, what's my verb? Expect. And is there a direct object? Yes. To race. There you go. What is special about Chase Lace here? They expect to race. <laughs> they expect to race, yes. All right, so we've got our correlative conjunctions. All right, so Chase and Lace should be diagrammed on a crayon as a subject. Do, 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 do. Go to town on this one. So you've got your subject is a crayon here. And what is special about this to raise this direct object? Infinitive. Infinitive, right. So it should look like your lounge chair. Like that. Remember, we, we made this connection that these infinitives look like prepositional phrases, right? When you diagram a prepositional phrase, doesn't it look just like this? Yes, because to is a preposition. Oh, I beeping. I wasn't the only one that heard beeping, right? Did other people hear beeping? Okay. So that's why it looks the same. All right, so here's your infinitive to race. You have both is on one side of that. It looks like this, but much neater. And is on the other side. It looks like this, but much neater. Both chase and lace expect to race. All right, tackle number 29. Number 29. Uh, Andrew, in the back, read us this sentence, please. Cheating will give others a bad impression of you. Okay, that's very different from Chase and Lace. Okay, yep. Highlight it first. Cheating will give others a bad impression of you. Look for subject, look for verb, look for direct object. This one. What's the subject of this sentence? Everybody. Cheating. Cheating. What's special about it? It's Ooh, it's a jar and it's going to walk like an Egyptian, y'all. Did you get that? Not, not. There it goes. Ooh. 
What's my verb? Will give. Will give. There it is. Will give what? What's the direct object? Impression. Impression. Yes. It is not others. It's not going to give others. What is others, you guys? Everybody, what's others? Indirect object. That's an indirect object, right? So it will go underneath that verb. Impression is here. Now, we've got some other words here. We already took care of others. A, bad. What are those? Those are adjectives, right? So those would go underneath. They are describing impression. And then what is this of you here? What is it? Prepositional. It's a prepositional phrase. Of you. There you go. And it goes underneath impression. All right, number 30 is going to get crazy. Let's do this one together. Uh, Josh, read us number 30, please. Mr. Lou judged the pie eating contest between the students and the teacher. Okay, let's break it down. Find the subject first. What is the subject? Mr. Lou. Verb. Should judge. Should judge. There it is. Should judge. Should judge what? Contest. Contest. All right, so we, we can put those in the diagram right away. Mr. Lou should judge contest. There we go. Let's get those in first. Those are always the first ones. Subject, verb, direct object. Now we can go back and start figuring out what everything else is. The first things I notice, oh, you guys need a second. Let me give you a second. I told you to diagram, and you guys went, yep, I'll diagram, and then Mrs. Meese just keeps on talking. All right, I'll pause. Let you diagram. Subject, verb, direct object. All right, we've got a few words here. The pie eating, what, is, where do, what are those? Where do they go? So these are adjectives. They would go underneath contest. The pie eating. Now, what do we have the rest of this? Between the students and the teachers. What do we have here? All right. The, the whole thing is a prepositional phrase. And we've got this word and. What does that mean? All right. It's a compound. All right. So we know that we've got a prepositional phrase. What is my preposition? Between. All right, so this is between. It goes right there. And the compound is the object of the preposition. All right, so it's students. Here's the crayon. Here. This should be attached. All right. So it's between, and then you have students and teachers. Both of those have a the underneath. This one really gets crazy. Ooh, no, go back. And both students, that has a the. Teachers also has a the. But here the compound is in the prepositional phrase. So that's where the crayon is. This and as a dead giveaway. There is a compound. I'm going to need to draw a crayon. There it is. And now we all want pie. Yes. Yes. Here we go. Let's draw a pie. Pie right here. Mm -mm. Pie. Mm -mm. There's some apples in it. Mm -mm. Apple pie. This doesn't look like pie at all. It's like a bowl of pasta. We can put. That's fine. Some kind of fluffy that you can't see because it's white. Some, put whipped cream on the top. You guys like whipped cream on your pie? Okay, whipped cream or ice cream. There we go. And one big spoon because I ain't sharing with y'all. I'm sorry. I'm just going to eat it myself. You have to get your own pie. That is my pie. <laughs> All right, good to go. All right, stand up. Stand up. 
Okay. Turn around. Turn around the other way. Okay. Step to the left. Step to the right. Step to the left. Turn around. Go like this. Yay, we got to the pie unit contest. Pat yourself on the back. High five. High five. Hit yourself in the face. Don't do that. Okay. Sit back down. One more. One more. All right. Two twelve. We could do grammar all day. It just, um, this class just goes by way too fast. It should be twice as long as it is. Oh, really, Miss Me. Okay. <laughs> okay, orange. We're going to start off in orange. That's where we're going to highlight this lesson. Uh, but first, of course, we start with the vocabulary. So we'll, we'll do those with pink and yellow. All right, but this is diagramming the predicate nominatives. And I like... I like nouns, so I'm just going to enter in nouns here. All right. It, it means the same thing. I like nouns better. So we're just going to say nouns. All right. Here's your two vocabulary. All right, so we've got stoic. Stoic. Uh, this is a person indifferent to pleasure and pain. A stoic. Uh, they don't like it. They don't like pleasure and pain. I mean, I mean, no. You can't tell if it's pleasure or pain. That's what I meant to say. All right. You tell them a joke, they don't laugh. They just look at you like you're crazy. Um, you tell them your kitten died, they don't say anything. They just look straight. All right. So they there's no distinction between good things, bad things, pleasure, pain, stoic. Indifferent. It would be, wouldn't it? Yeah. Living without a kitten. I think that would be an unhappy life, too. Oh, you meant stoic. Yeah. Yeah. Sorry. All right. So there's the, there's stoic as an adjective, stoic as a noun. It, I have a two here. I don't know why. You really just need to know stoic. All right. It, it's the same whether it's an adjective or a noun. Um, and sybaratic. Sybaritic. This is extravagant, sensual, sybaritic, or cyberitic. I'm not sure which it is. Cyberitic or sybaritic. All right, so just two. There's just two. All right, predicate nouns. Predicate nouns. All right, so we've got quite a few notes here. Um, and we'll do, some ex we'll do some small examples of these. Um, so here we go. A predicate noun renames the subject. It is a noun that follows the verb, and it renames the subject, person, animal, or thing. Whatever your subject is, the predicate noun renames it. Why is it called a predicate noun? Where is it in the sentence if it's a predicate noun? What would you get? It's in the predicate. It is a noun in the predicate that is talking about your subject. All right. Um, it is joined by a linking verb. It's a linking verb, not an action verb. A linking verb. All right. Remember those linking verbs. Here's some really popular ones. Very. Um, these ones are used a lot. Am, is, are, was, were, be, being, been, become, seen. Especially, am, is, are, was, were, be, being, been. Especially those eight. Those are on page 106. You memorized them. Remember, a linking verb does not show action. And it is not helping an action verb. It's not a helping verb. All right? It connects. The person, animal, thing, the subject to a predicate noun. All right, so a linking verb connects the subject to the predicate noun. We'll look at some examples and you'll go, oh, yeah, I got that. I know what that is. All right, so underneath 212, grab your highlighters. So here I have the linking verbs highlighted in blue. Is, is. 
And is connects Judge and Rufus King. I have another one. Was. Was is a linking verb. And it connects Rufus King and Statesman. The last example there on page 212 is Rufus King and Judge is being connected together. Is is the linking verb. And it connects Rufus King to Judge. Do you see that Judge is a part of the predicate? It's way over here after the verb. It is a predicate noun. All right, was at the bottom, there's your linking verb, connecting statesman, Rufus King. These two are connected, all right, by this linking verb. Uh, yeah, okay. All right, a couple of examples. You don't have to, well, maybe you want to write this down. Let's, let's just do a couple of simple examples here on the board. I was going to do a video, but it's not a very interesting video. All right, so let's say my cat is Buddy, and he really is. I do have a cat named Buddy. Okay, my cat is Buddy. What is my linking verb here? Is. is. What are the two nouns it's linking together? Cat here and Buddy here. Now, if you can tell you've got a linking verb with a predicate noun if this could be an equal sign, right? In math, you have 1 plus 1 equals 2, right? 1 plus 1 is 2. Don't these mean the same thing? Same in, oh look, we're doing math and grammar class. Did y'all catch that? Math and grammar class. All right, we can do the same thing here. Cat equals buddy. Is this, this is fine, right? This is exactly what I'm saying there. The cat is buddy. The cat equals buddy, just like you would use an equal sign in math. That is what these linking verbs do. Connect the subject. This is a predicate noun, because buddy is a noun, in the predicate, but it is talking about the subject. It's talking about Buddy the cat. Does that make sense? Okay. Um, let's go to top of page 213. Okay. The top of page 213. So how do you know if you have a linking verb? How do you know? All right. Sometimes maybe the verb doesn't say is or was or am or are. How do you know? Well. You can replace it, all right? You can replace it. So if you take the verb, whatever it might be, and you replace it with was or is also works good. And if one equals the other, then you have a linking verb. Okay, so this example right here, Rufus King was a U.S. Senator. Rufus King equals Senator. It checks out. Yeah, it checks out. We have Rufus King. This is my subject. We have Senator. That's the predicate noun. Yeah, they are connected together by what? Okay. We could put an equal sign there because we like math. And it would, it checks out. It's a link. All right. Um, in the middle, what happens if you got a question? You guys already know what to do. Reword it. Reword it. So it's harder to tell if your sentence is in the form of a question. Was Rufus King a high federalist? Reword it. Rufus King was a high federalist. So is Rufus King connected with federalist? Yes. We're saying that is another name. For Rufus King. Rufus King equals Federalist. It's a linking verb. Okay? Can you have compounds? 
predicate nouns? Yes, you can. Of course you can. Yes. Right here down at the bottom. Yes. So notice how on the crayon, we've got three people on that crayon. When you've got a third one, you just we just keep making lines in the crayon if there is more than one in that compound. Here we've got three. So we just made a line in the middle of that crayon. All right. Good to go. Yeah, yeah, yeah. All right. I uh, want us to practice. Yeah, let's just do these. These are. Um, Look at the top of page 214. We do need to talk about diagramming these. Oh, it's right here. No, no, no. Go back to 213. I'm like, where is it? Where is it? Here it is. All right, diagramming. Notice that this line right here is slanted when you have a predicate noun. Why? Because it is pointing back to the subject. Okay, it is saying, I'm actually referring to that subject. All right, so that's why it's slanted like that. So it renames the subject? It renames the subject when it's a predicate noun. Yeah. Look at page 214 at the top. Uh, Zoe, at the top of page 214, read that sentence that's in the diagram. Jane has been our mutual friend. Right. Do you notice that slanted line again? Friend? What is friend referring to? What's it? renaming James. James all right so that's why it's slanted you could draw a little arrow there right you could you can make it like it's like a little arrow right it's pointing back to the subject okay if I was going to diagram this one with buddy cat is it's buddy all right it's kind of like a little slanted woo because it's it's referring, renaming the subject. All right. Um, Laura M., read the next sentence under James about John. John is a common name. Right. We see another slanted line there, don't we? Because it is renaming, connecting name with, name with John. John, right. You're going you're gonna to make me do arm, arm movement. Name with John. All right, very good. One to diagram. One to diagram. Number 30. Number 30. And this one, let's highlight together. You diagram it on your own. What is the subject? Boasting. Boasting. What is my verb? Now you've got another question you've got to start asking yourself. Is it action or is it linking? Is, and what is it here? Is it action or linking? Linking. Which means you need to look for a predicate noun. Is there a predicate noun? What is it? Downfall. All right, diagram. Last one, we'll take a break. See, that just flew by that grammar. Woo, that's me. Don't say it's over. This is an L because this is a linking verb, which changes your diagram a little bit. Let me make it look more like an L. L. It's a linking verb. I get that straight. Yeah. All right. Boasting is a special kind of noun, people. It's a special subject. What kind of subject is it here? The gerund. What gave it away? The ing. All right. So it's walking like an Egyptian here. Verb, what is it? 
Can be, right here. Mm -hmm. Can be. Now, it's a linking verb, which means we have a predicate noun, which means we have a slanted line. And what is your predicate noun? And what do we do with ones? It's an adjective. It goes under look at that. You'll have to do number 29. Ooh, you're going to have fun with that one. Both Prudence and Clotilda. Do we got any Clotildas in the room? Clotilda. So, love your mom that she didn't name you Clotilda. Why did you name Clotilda? Clotilda. Tonight at dinner, give your mom a big hug and say, well, I guess if you're a girl. And if you're a boy, thank your mom that she didn't name you Clotilda. Give your mom a big hug and say, thank you so much for not naming me Clotilda. <laughs> I don't know. I, it's, a very strange it's just a strange name for a girl. I've never even heard of that girl. Clotilda. All right, y'all. You made it through the grammar. Close it up and go take a break. Take a few minutes. Go walk out there. Get yourself a drink of water. Go check your hair in the restroom. Go look out the window. Go stare at somebody in another class. Let's look up Clotilda. Let's see what that name means. Clotilda. I hope it's nothing bad. Let's see. What does... Well, yeah, we're okay with this. What does Clotilda mean? Weird name. It's a weird name. Oh, I'm going to have to start it from the beginning. Want to know what does Clotilda mean? Never met a Clotilda. Well, it won't let me go back. It won't let me join the network. It knows. It knows that's what we want to do. <laughs> it says, uh-uh. I was going to try to figure out what does Clotilda mean. <laughs> it, it won't let me. I'm curious now. See? Clotilda. Seriously, thanks, Mom. She did not is name you Clotilda. Is that even a name? Evidently. It's in the grammar book. If it's in the grammar book, it don't lie. It's true. What? Yes. What does Clotilda mean? Oh. Loud battle. It doesn't, it won't tell us. What does it mean? Loud battle. Oh. Loud what? Loud battle. <laughs> and it's German. German. Clotilda. <laughs> Yes. We love it. Well, now you know Clotilda. <laughs> Start shouting Clotilda over on the point of the day.
and thank mom tonight. This very night, go home and just give her a hug and say thank you so much for not naming me Clotilda. And she'll, she'll think you like, lost your mind. And you'll say, no, we just had a great time in grammar. Thank you, Mom, for not naming me a mom. <laughs> all right, all right. Let's talk about the writing. Let's talk about the writing. All right, so the literary analysis. Tell me, somebody's going to tell us. What is literary analysis? Somebody's going to tell us what it is. Somebody, somebody, somebody tell us what it is. Thank you. Awfully clear. What is it? Examining something critically by looking at its different parts. Okay. Can you tell us what that is in your own words? Like, how would you describe it to Clotilda if she was here? <laughs> and Clotilda is a five book. Yes. Like, looking deeper to the meaning of a story. Okay. Good. Good. Yes, you want to add to that, Laura? Looking at the individual like components of the story to the end, it might be one book. Okay, yeah, for a deeper meaning, right? Um, what kind of uh, parts, what kind of parts can you look at? What are some examples of parts of a story? Mm -hmm. Characters. The characters, yep. The setting. The setting. Symbols. Symbols, yes. What else? The mood, the mood, imagery. the imagery. Yes. What else? The personification, the plot, the, plot. the, irony. the irony. What do these sound like? The literary Don't they sound like the literary devices, the literary elements? All right. Do you have your cheat sheet? Do you have one there? Yeah. All right. So the cheat sheet. There's also one in the folder. There's also one in the homework folder. It's okay um, for this week. All right, so you look at the deeper meaning or the theme of a story. What is the theme? Theme, theme. What is, what is the theme? What is that? The main idea? Yes, what else could it be? You can say the definition. Yes. Yes, what else? Jacob. How the whole story. What the whole story is all about. Good. The life lesson of the story. Yes, the life mm -hmm. lesson. What does the character learn by the end of the story? Okay. Um, in Thank You, Ma'am by Langston Hughes, what does the character learn by the end of the story? And whatever that is, probably has a lot to do with what the theme is. All right, so think back to Thank You, Ma'am. I think I have a picture. So, thank you, ma'am. Um, what does this boy learn by the end of the story? If you take somebody's purse, you'll get a free meal and ten dollars. <laughs> that's actually <laughs> so. That is what he learns on the. That's what happens on the outside. Yes, very good. But Osley Claire mentioned a deeper meaning, right? So that is what happens on the outside, but. From how he reacts at the end of the story, we know that he's learned something deeper, right? Yeah. Did you want to say something? No. no? <laughs> what does he learn by the end of the story? What is the deeper meaning that he learns by the end of the story? Trust. Hmm? Trust. Trust. Um, Explain a little bit. Trust is because um, in the beginning of the story, he doesn't trust his mom yet. He just goes up and sees her. Okay, he's going to try to pay her purse. Um, in the end, he trusts her and he doesn't, like, he doesn't grab her purse and run and like, take her money. Why? Because he doesn't want her to lose her purse in the end. Why does he care? Because she's cleaning up. She passed away, so she cleaned, she cleaned him up and she gave him some dinner. Okay, so we have a different boy by the end of this little story, don't we? Mm -hmm. Something is different about him. Why does he not, like you said, trust? All right, why does he not grab the purse? He's given the opportunity. Why does he not, why doesn't he do it? Because he was shown kindness. He was shown kindness, right? And so how does that change him? I think it makes him thankful to that person. So he does not want to do something that is wrong, that that person has said is wrong. Okay. He doesn't want the story to ruin his life. Okay. These are good. These are good thoughts. What else? What has changed within him by the end of the story? Other thoughts? Um, he's not really 
Uh, we hope, right? Well, he's wearing the same clothes, right? Oh, that's true. Yeah. Okay. So perhaps in someone showing him kindness, and she could have busted him, right? I mean, she probably could have done it by herself. She did not need to call the police. You get the idea. This woman could just pound him. But she doesn't, and she shows him kindness. She and does pound him a little bit. She does a little bit, right? She <laughs> drags him home. Right. <laughs> um, what was it? A full Nelson? Yeah. Is that what it referred to? Okay. Um, so she dragged. Does anybody not know what a full Nelson is? It's a, a red machine. It's like kind of like a chokehold where they like hold you. Okay. Can you demonstrate on Josh? <laughs> <laughs> Seriously. Dude. Just don't um don't <laughs> drag him across the room. But, but can show us what. Can I do that on Andrew? Yeah, choke hold Andrew. Andrew. Yeah. I don't do a full Nelson on Andrew, but don't drag him anywhere. All right. Oh, All right, and then she's going to drag him down the street, right? It looks like an awkward hug. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right, there you go. That was good. That was good. Thank you, Isaac. Uh, where were, what were we talking about? Oh, she could she could take him out, right? But she doesn't. She shows him kindness, and it changes him. It changes him, right? All right. Um, so for this week, let's talk about what you got to do this week. So this week, I have this little thing here that you can clip in, all right, for examples. For this week, you have test number five. Yay. Part of your test is going to be a new story, short story, and a literary analysis paragraph, all right? And if you're wondering, well, what would be a, an example of a literary analysis paragraph so that I could kind of model what I do after it, then here's a couple of examples of that. So let's look at the first one. Let's look at the, the first one that's on the top, okay? And you look at it. Oh, yay, we can find clips folder now. It finally lets us join. Now it's random. We don't need to. Laura's already told us what clips folder is. Okay. All right, so let's look at this one right here. All right, so for the test, um, for this paragraph that you have to write, it'll be a new story. It's one you haven't read. There's a link in the homework. Um, and I tell you the first sentence that you need to write. I've written it on the test for you. And it's going to sound like this. In the story, thank you, ma'am, the author uses, whoops, uses, and then you pick a literary element to exemplify the theme of and then you have to pick the theme, all right? And everybody's first sentence is going to sound like that. I want to, you're going to, here's your literary element and your theme, okay? Then you will have two examples, all right? So one example of your element. Here's this person's example right here. So this person gives us the example, here it is, right from the story. Here is the example of irony. The reader expects the woman to be mad at the boy for stealing, but she invites him into her home. It's irony. Something is different than what you expect it to be. So you give the example, but then you got to take it to the analysis part. Um, just telling the example is not analysis. All right? So you... And I put this on your homework. I'll show it to you in a second. I put this on the test. Give me the example and then tell me how does that show the theme. That is the analysis. So this shows irony because what one would expect to happen does it. Instead of condemning him, she shows him honor. Do you see the theme is right there? Okay. So here's the literary element you choose. How does it show the theme? That is analysis. Okay? It's not a summary. 
You don't tell me all the events that happen. You pick, here's this example. It shows the literary element, and here's how it does that. Okay? And then you, you're going to tell me another example. All right, so here's another example. I'll do this one in pink. So she gives another example here. And I'm sorry, I'm not very good at drawing straight lines, but here you go. All right. Um, another example is when the reader expects the boy to steal or take advantage of her generosity, but he doesn't. All right. He reciprocates the honor the woman showed him. All right. So there, see it? This is the analysis. How does that example show the thing? You've got to do that. That's what makes it a literary analysis. Not a summary, not just here's the example. Um, you have to take it deeper and tell me how does that show the thing. Okay? Look at the second example that you have. It's on the back. All right, here's the second example on the back. All right, and this person does the same thing. This person was a totally different theme, a totally different um uh, literary element. This person chose symbol, symbolism, to emphasize trust. So the symbolism shows trust. All right, now you got to prove it to me. All right, so she has one example, and, and there were some terrific examples. I just chose the first two that were emailed to me. Um, so, you know, if yours is not here, there were some terrific examples of this. Um, these are just the first two emails. All right, so here's the example. And she doesn't just say the example. She takes it deeper. How does that show the thing? So here we have one example of the young boy does not think twice about stealing her purse. He just goes for it, not very effectively. This demonstrates that there is no trust. There's the thing between the lady and the boy. He is just a desperate street urchin trying to get some easy money. All right, so the symbol of the purse demonstrates that there is no trust. All right, so she's mentioned the literary element, and she connects that with the theme. That is analysis. All right, and then one more here. Second example. Here we go. What do we think about green? Ooh, that made it really... Oh, oh, it's doing the, oh wait, nope, let's just do this. Let's go back to green. All right, here it is, the second example. All right, and you can see that it, it takes a, a couple of sentences to give the example and then show how does that example show the thing. All right, it, it takes a couple of sentences. She's got three sentences here to do that. All right, and then her last sentence is a clincher kind of sums it up. This story shows that something as humble as a purse, there was the, um, the symbol, can be used to demonstrate the changing of a life through trust. There's the theme. Okay. Um, all right, let's take a look at your actual homework now that I can get in. And I'll show you where that will be. All right, so in your homework folder, here it is. Don't, don't, just take the, all right. So if you are not in the habit of checking the homework sheet, you need to do so. Um, you'll miss things. All right, so here's the homework sheet for this week. Uh, you'll notice there's no writing due because it's on the test. If you want to turn your writing in to me Monday, you can. Um, but you could just include it on the test. That's fine. Um, and you'll see here on the vocab, you've got the four pairs of correlative conjunctions. Make sure you know those for the quiz. Um, and let's talk about grammar test five. Look at all these lessons. What does this mean, Mrs. Meat? It's going to take me 50 hours to study through this. No, it won't. No, it won't. Let me show you all you need to do. What's the first lesson mentioned here? Lesson one. I'm going to demonstrate for you. All right, lesson one. So you have your grammar book, and you go to lesson one. 
Oh, it's the four types of sentences. I know what those are. Declarative, that's a period. Imperative, that's a command. Interrogative, that's the question mark. And which is the one I'm missing? That's the exclamation mark. Move on. Okay. There's probably one question on that test about a kind of sentence. Move on. What's the next number? Two. two. So I look at lesson two. Okay, complete sentences, fragments, and run-ons. So, the notes that I have highlighted, I'm going to read through those. Make sure that I know what makes a sentence a complete sentence, what makes it a run-on. But we've gone over this and over this and over this. Right? This is not the first time you've seen lesson two. So, as you go on, you ought to be able, these things should start just coming to you like this. You spend less and less and less time having to review them because you know them, right? Um, what's the next one? Three. Three. Traits. Ooh, action verbs, simple subject, simple predicates. And you're like, oh, yeah, I, I, I got this. I know what these are. Action verbs, the action that the subject does. And we diagram all the time. Simple subject, simple predicate. Yep. That's the subject of the sentence, the verb, what the subject does, I got it. And then you move on. So it, it shouldn't take you, I would say, mm, somewhere between 30 minutes and an hour to study for a grammar test, depending on how well you study before and you know the subjects, okay? You know those lessons. As you go on, you should become very, very familiar with them and you don't have to spend as much time reviewing them, if any time at all, okay? Um, so just because you see that, and you're like, oh my goodness, it's like one, two, three, that's like 150 lessons up there, I gotta, no. You spend the time on the ones you're not as familiar with, the, the lessons that you know, just breeze right on through, okay? All right, let me show you one more thing, and then you're out. Ooh, my gracious God. We might actually get out early. Don't hold your breath. I'll just talk slow to make sure that we get four minutes in. No, I'm just kidding. All right, let me show you one last thing. All right, let me show you the test. Last thing. All right, so mom gets the test. You don't get the test. When, you're, when you study and you've spent 30 to minutes to an hour, whatever it takes for you, um, and you're ready, that's when you let mom know. But do spend some time studying first. Um, I, I email you guys your tests back because I, I, I don't give them back to you anymore. But you, you can keep those tests that you've done before. Look at those to help you study as well. Don't just chuck those into the trash and it's out of here. Those are actually very helpful study tools, especially the ones you get incorrect. All right? Um, that's an excellent way to know exactly what you should study and what you don't need to, what you already know. All right, so here's test number five. The writing is here. All right, so it's a literary analysis paragraph. There's another story in the folder um, right here. It's called The Dinner Party. You'll like it. It's right here, The Dinner Party, right in the folder. It's really interesting and short. All right, I tell you what the first sentence is. You need to pick a literary element. Where is this cheat sheet? What is that talking about? The paper. Yes, and what if you say, oh, Miss Meese, I don't know where mine is. Don't worry. It's right here in the folder. It's right here in the folder, okay? Um, I want you to give me the definition of that literary element, and it just comes right from the cheat sheet. Thank you, Osley Claire. That was, that's a good idea to do that. You have an example, and then explain how it shows the theme. Then you have another example of that element. How does it show the theme? 
The last sentence is a clincher. It wraps up. It revisits the first sentence. It doesn't, don't repeat it word for word. And then make sure you do this. Answer this question. Why does the author choose this element to show the theme? That is analysis. All right? That is analysis. So here, here is the paragraph you have to write as part of your test. It's got to be tight. Okay? All right. Any questions about this? You are dismissed at one minute early. All right. Great job in class today, everybody. You all make grammar fun. Oh, wait, let me spray. Wait, wait. Thank you guys for helping me with that. I hear that sound. That's the sound of help. Thank, Thank you. you. You guys have a great afternoon. You're welcome. You guys have a wonderful afternoon. Try to enjoy it, even though you won't have grammar anymore. Thank you. You're welcome. Have a good afternoon. Yes. Thank you. Thank you, Zoe. Could you do this one? Thank you. I appreciate it.